Now uh, I have the great pleasure and honor of introducing Linda Chavez. And, and like the other speakers I've introduced, she has accomplished many things, both domestically and internationally, on the cause of equal rights and civil rights. Uh, but to, today, um, we're going to ask her to talk a little bit about her work um, working to advise the United Nations Subcommission on Human Rights, um, what her experience is looking at the way the people of Camp Ashraf have been treated and the current danger that they are in because of the terror listing and how important it is for the United Nations to declare Camp Liberty a refugee camp so that the people of that area can be treated with dignity and respect and protected from being able to be assaulted by the Iraqi government like they have two times before. So let's hear for Linda Sanchez. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me also uh, give my thanks uh, to Patrick Kennedy. And I had the privilege over the years, you may not know this, Patrick, I used to be a Democrat before I was a Republican. I had the privilege a number of years ago in 1980 to actually write campaign literature for your father uh, when I was uh, with the American Federation of Teachers. And when I was nominated by George W. Bush to be Secretary of Labor, he called me up to congratulate me. And he said, now, what would be most healthy to you? Should I oppose you or should I support you? <laughs> uh, so we've, uh, we've been on both sides. And I do think that it is interesting that in Washington, which has become so incredibly polarized politically over the last few years, it is really quite remarkable to have a panel of people who stretch across such a wide ideological and political spectrum. I think it is a testament to the fact that this is not a partisan issue. In a real sense, this is not a political issue and should not be a political issue. This is a human rights issue. It is an issue about what the Constitution of the United States means, what due process means, and what our judicial systems should mean. So it is a privilege uh, to come here and talk. And as Patrick said, uh, my work with the United Nations uh, Subcommission on the Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities started in 1992. I was appointed by uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush, or I should say I was nominated, uh, by the U.S. government uh, under that administration. But I served also through the Clinton administration in that position because I was elected by the United Nations Human Rights Commission. And that was the first opportunity I had to meet anyone from the MEK. And I have to tell you, when I was first approached, I was a little suspicious. Who were these people calling themselves the Mujahideen? Uh, were these people our friends? Were these people dangerous? And I got to know the people who worked uh, at the United Nations, and I found out that what they were interested in was the same thing I was interested in, and that is the protection of human rights, and their focus was on the protection of human rights in Iran. And they provided me, over those four years, valuable information about the human rights violations that were going on in Iran, and particularly because it was a focus of my interest, on the human rights violations that were going on against women. Because if you look at any society, if you want to judge a society, is this a good society, is this a bad society, one of the most effective and quickest ways to determine whether these people are friends or they are enemies, is to look at how they treat their women. And, and I, do not, I do not believe that there is any place practically in the world where women are more badly treated than they are in Iran. Women are denied the most basic rights. They're told how to dress. You can be a tourist in Iran, and you can have the vice police pull you off the side because you are not dressed to their standards. Women are imprisoned. 
They are put in the most appalling conditions. They are sometimes tortured. They are finally, some of them, executed in the most brutal, inhumane ways. And women in Iran, as well as all of the Iranian people, have had to suffer under this regime for more than 30 years. Now, it's not just that Iran violates human rights within its own country. The regime is also a direct threat against the world. And by the way, we're talking about the MEK being terrorists. We know who the terrorists are. The terrorists are the regime in Iran. There, the whole idea of listing an organization on the foreign terrorist list is based on the premise that they pose a direct, credible threat to the United States. Well, we know that there is American blood on the hands of the regime in Iran. They were behind the Beirut bombing, embassy bombing. They were behind the, the bombing of, of the U.S. Uh, barracks. They have American blood on their hands. So we know they are the threat. We also know that the delay, the sort of taking at face value that maybe they will talk to us, maybe they will let us inspect uh, what's going on in Iran, has allowed them the opportunity to enrich uranium to make nuclear bombs. This is something we know, and press reports suggest that they already have enough uh, enriched uranium to make at least four bombs, it may be more. Now, I want to talk a minute about conditions for those who are living, the remaining people who are in Camp Ashraf, uh, but also, I think, even more in peril, those who have been moved to uh, Camp Liberty. We're about to enter the summer right now, and many of you from that part of the world uh, are very familiar with what summers are like. Uh, in Iran. We're talking about temperatures that can get brutally hot. And yet the people who are living in Camp Liberty do not even have an adequate water supply system. They have not been able to tap into the water system. Water is have to, has to be tanked in. There is not sufficient water. It does not provide for proper hygiene. It, the women who are in those camps have to be confronted on a daily basis with the soldiers who, by the way, all are armed. I mean, we're all talking about whether or not the uh, MEK is armed. We know who has arms. We know who has weapons. We know who has rifles uh, aimed at people. It is the Iraqi forces that are in control of Camp Liberty. Now, I believe in the freedom of movement of people. I believe that people, particularly those who are under threat of repression by their governments, should have the right to be able to leave. And I think it is absolutely clear that those who are in Camp Liberty are prisoners. They have no freedom of movement. They can't go outside Camp Liberty, not even to get adequate medical care when they need it. They don't allow people in to be able to interview them to find out what the conditions are. It is a concentration camp. That's what it is. And so I think it is absolutely one, um, one aspect that human rights are being violated by the fact that these people are not being treated as refugees. And I will say to uh, General Phillips, that you know, one of the things that happened when people turned over their weapons, when they gave up their personal weapons, when the camp gave up its military weapons, one of the things the United States did was to sign a pledge with each of those individuals guaranteeing their security. Those pledges bear the stamp of the United States government, and yet we are not protecting those people. And the only way to protect those people is to delist the MEK so that these people have the freedom to go and to live where they choose. Thank you very much.